Welcome to our panel today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about chasing equity and figuring out ways to quantify ourselves uh, into a more inclusive future. Uh, I am so excited to be having this conversation today with three incredible human beings, um, and I hope that you enjoy it very much as well. So first, I'd love to, uh, to have everybody introduce themselves. So Geraldine, uh, would love to start with you. Hi, Kendra. Thank you for this opportunity, first of all, and thank you to South by Southwest for allowing us to have this conversation so um, publicly. Um, I am a journalist, I'm a writer, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm also now in AI research and I'm working with Stanford and studying ways to monitor and measure bias. Um, in video and text. And specifically, we've been looking at cable TV. I'm also the host of a new podcast sponsored by the Southern Poverty Law Center called Sounds Like Hate. And that's me. And Paul. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to see you all again. Um, I'm Paul Butler. I'm the President and Chief Transformation Officer of New America, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C. that's looking at uh, technological and social change um, and how we might take advantage of those opportunities that are happening with those uh, in order to fulfill the promise of America. Um, so I'm happy to be here. It's great to see all of you again. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Me too. Me too. And lastly, Jason. Thanks, Kendra. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Rosario. I am the Global Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at BBDO. Uh, I am also a, an avid and a passionate masculinity, new age manhood, uh, thought leader, conversationalist. Uh, I have built a body of work that explores modern masculinity and its implications on diversity, equity, and inclusion through allyship. Uh, and so I'm excited to be here and lend my perspective to this conversation. Thank you again, South by Southwest, for inviting us. I am so incredibly honored to be in the company of all of you and certainly uh, to be sharing this conversation uh, very publicly in a way that I think is, is gonna be really interesting for me. It'll be the highlight of my day uh, and I hope that it's the highlight of everybody else's too. I'm Kendra Clark. I am the SVP of Data Science and Product Development at Sparks and Honey. Uh, and so by day, I run a data science team focused on quantifying culture. And, and figuring out what today in culture means across any industry, across a myriad of subjects. Uh, and I've spent the last 12 or so years uh, in data science, trying to understand how we use data to build better futures. Uh, I also am a regular speech speaker on issues of equity uh, and technology. Uh, and currently, in addition to my day job, um, I am working on launching a nonprofit um, focused on funding uh, funding tech organizations, funding new tech organizations uh, founded and run by marginalized individuals, uh, most especially black and brown individuals uh, and closing some of that venture funding gap. So um, now that we know all of us, uh, uh, let's, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about history. Let's talk about the past a little bit uh, because uh, that brings us to where we are. And also there is this element of data that is all of, like is all historical. Everything that we know has already happened. Uh, and we are now using what has already happened to try to figure out what to do now and what to do in the future. Uh, which means that as our history is very biased, we are bringing those biases into everything that we're doing right now. Um, so, let's go back a little bit in time. Let's talk about some of what is missing from the record. Uh, and let's talk about how we can maybe quantify the dual concepts of like resistance and resilience. Uh, happy to start kind of anywhere. I think, uh, yeah, I just wanted to start by um, maybe rewinding a little bit um, and also build as Kendra, as you said, on kind of what, what brought us to this conversation when we initially started thinking about it. And it is that there's so much um, that we have not seen uh, because of racism um, and because of white supremacy and because of the systems of oppression. Um, there's so much culture that we have not experienced. It, it was never created in the first place. 
and our ambition really was to try and begin to try and see if we can recapture that using data, using new metrics, using new systems. Um, and, and picking up where you left off, Kendra, I think what really sticks out for me um, are those stories um, and the layers of those stories um, that I think we've all done a, a great job you know, at flattening um, a lot of the stories and we're missing so much of the depth um, in the individuals. We've created um, narratives you know, about, um, you know, about slavery um, and we've created very kind of um, uh, repeatable stories um, that do a number of things uh, for us as we think about the past, um, but they don't nearly capture the depth and complexity of even one experience. Um, and I think part of our, our, our work is to really make those stories more complex um, and to reveal those complexities. Yeah, I mean, what I'm excited about uh, in this conversation is that it's no coincidence we're having it during Black History Month. And oftentimes when we look at Black History Month, we look at it through a lens of uh, kind of survival and resistance coming out of whether it's slavery, Jim Crow, the civil rights movement, um, but we never really center uh, Black excellence uh, or even the African continent within the context of forward looking and how we might be able to celebrate uh, our, our contributions to culture. And so uh, that's what I'm excited about in this conversation that we'll be able to move in that direction a little bit more. Yeah, if, if I could jump in, I wanna just be more specific and concrete. Like when we look back and we talk about resistance, we hear the same narratives all the time. And there's this picture that there were just a few big rebellions and attempts at resistance during slavery, when in reality, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of attempts at escape, at resistance and rebellion. And, and not only that, it happened so often that there were massive attempts to silence slaves. So the kind of stories we don't hear about, we've heard about quilts and people leaving signals on the clothing line. So you, you know, it's a safe place to pass and so on, but there was daily resistance. Slaves were not in most churches allowed to speak to each other when they went to church for fear that they were communicating ways to resist. Slaves were not allowed to socialize in normal ways for fear they were going to resist. That fear was rooted in reality. We didn't passively do these jobs that were assigned to us. We resisted and resisted and resisted. We took our freedom and we don't tell those stories. And there are ways today to go back and find those stories. So one example I'll tell you quickly is the uh, Work uh, Projects Administration, WPA, between 1936 and 1938, 2,300 former slaves were interviewed. 2,300, that's 2,300 stories. Can you imagine what we could do with those stories? And I have personally looked at many of them, not all of course, but many, but we now have technology. We have machine learning and artificial intelligence. We can scrape those stories to pull out data. We can scrape those stories to find out what exceptional things happened. You can pick one story and turn it into a film or a novel. I mean, that resource alone is a massive trove of information. And we, are, we need to tell more stories of black resistance and rebellion. Like that's what builds us up. And we have to tell our stories not once, but again and again and again for every generation. And the more we see stories of Black people doing things that show our independence, the more we'll start to see stories of Black people doing normal everyday things like hiking or writing or building blocks. I don't know. Like we just don't see those stories enough. And we have to begin by looking backwards at where we were so we can look forward. I think that's incredibly important. And like uh, so many, so many things come to mind immediately in that, Geraldine. Uh, the first of which is really, I read, um, I read a book relatively recently um, written by uh, an African-American studies 
a professor who happens to be white um, and is largely a Civil War scholar, if I'm honest, about his work. Uh, but essentially, it was this story about... Uh, well, first it was a story about like racism in the antebellum era in the North. So just post slavery Northern story is set in New York talking about uh, the complicity uh, of a number of it, law enforcement individuals and other individuals within it, New York city in the trafficking of black people to the South, whether they were escaped from enslavement or were, were never enslaved, were in fact born free, but were simply conveniently uh, trafficked to the South when, when someone else had gone missing from a plantation uh, or from a, a property of some kind. Uh, and one of the things that was so striking and frustrating about this book was that it was very clearly centered on the white individuals involved in this story, though it was supposed to be a story about the people who were kidnapped, the people who were trafficked, it was instead centered more on the white characters um, and very much kind of geared toward what we consider like a white gaze. And part of that is certainly that there is a laziness that happens to us because of our canon, because of some of the records that are that are considered easier to get to, easier to unpack, easier to understand. And it takes a little bit more work sometimes, though, though the data is right there, the evidence is right there, but it takes work to uncenter what we've accepted as canon. And so there's a lot of import in looking at what has always been there, what is already there, right? Um, I, I did myself a favor the other day of watching the documentary Black Art, um, The Absence of Light, which is incredible. But one of the things that, uh, and I'm, I'm a bit of an art nerd. So, so one of the things that uh, the documentary talks about is uh, David Driscoll's 1976 uh, Two Centuries of Black Art exhibit and how mind blown people, you know, near 50 years ago at this point were that we had evidence of two centuries of black art in this country already, more than that, certainly. Um, but also in that was very much that resistance that we're talking about too, right? So uh, the, the potter, uh, David Drake, who in the antebellum era, when it was illegal for black people to read, was in fact inscribing his ceramics with, with various phrases. The, the resistance is, is there, it's evident and like continues to be so important. The, the most beautiful moment in that doc is when there's a, a painter, his name's Richard Mayhew, and he paints these amazing images. And he says, people always look at his art and call them landscapes because they're abstract um, and they look like la landscapes. And he says, those aren't landscapes, those are mindscapes. And, and I love that because this is an artist who is free to express himself and he, he did it. That's a story of resistance. He did it in a space where the canon, so-called canon didn't accept him. And he went ahead and made his, his mindscapes. Um, and I also, in the space of talking about quantifying resistance and re rebellion, it's also really important to give a shout out to EJI, the Equal Justice Institute, that is single-handedly documenting the history of lynching across America, because we have to tell that story again and again and again, because it will happen and it is happening now. And if we don't have these difficult conversations about why evil like that begins and occurs, then we, we are in danger of repeating it. Well, I think that's right too, Geraldine. I mean, what we, what we miss then are the patterns. Um, and how those same systems are being replicated. Um, and that's where the data, um, Kendra, you can speak to this better than probably any of us, but how the data itself is the evidence and that evidence provides the pattern. And, and when you look at the patterns, you see that there really hasn't been that much of a break at all between those systems of oppression uh, and what we experience today and that they, although they may they may look different, but in many cases they don't at all, um, that they are actually very much connected and very much repeating those same cycles. Um, and I think that's what, that's, I think what we're also trying to uncover here is 
um, how can data tell us uh, and connect us back in order to give us more information about what we're experiencing today, that it is all happening in context um, and that there wasn't these big breaks um, between history. Um, it is still very much our present. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think that the, the data illuminates so much. I mean, it is by itself kind of value neutral. It is simply a, a statement, a document of something that has happened. And yet we, we see by examining the data, the ways in which like, to, to your point, Paul, like racism still exists. Inequities in our systems still very much exist. They've maybe changed shape. They've maybe changed their expression a little bit, but they're, they're versions of the same thing. Every generation kind of has our own new flavor that we have to grapple with, but ultimately we're, we're talking about the same things. I, I feel like one of the things that we, we tend to kind of come to uh, as evidence of progress is, is this idea of, of first, you know, uh, we, we have the I mean, Mae Jemison was one of my one of my many childhood heroes, but uh, one of my favorites for sure. The first black woman in space, uh, Mae Jemison, uh, and and I remember being a child and being so incredibly excited to have someone who looked like me in some way, shape, or form who went to space. That was all I wanted. But now, you know, some thirty years or so later, almost we are still having many firsts. The, you know, uh, we have our first black gay congressperson at a federal level now in Mondaire Jones. We have, uh, we have our first black woman VP, our first black VP, first black woman VP, and like recently, you know, had a first, our first black president. It certainly doesn't mean we're over, but a lot of times we feel like it does. So like, I'd love to explore a little bit kind of First is a marker. It is a piece of data. But what does that actually mean? And how does our con conception of it shift as a result of uh, time, experience, uh, being in a different part of our equity cycle, if it were? One thing that jumps out to me, um, it, it, it says that, we're, that America is still very much an experiment itself. When we think about our, our history, um, as this long arc of history, and we use that phrase very poetically, especially when we talk about racial and social justice. Um, but that arc is in, in the grand scheme of time is very short. Um, and so we talk about the proximity um, to, to Geraldine, the way that you painted the picture about the work at EJI, our proximity to those experiences of lynching is so close. Um, it is very close. It is still with us. Um, it is not a distant past. Um, and in time, and we think about time, America in many ways is still very much an experiment, which is why we're still experiencing so many firsts. Um, and I think that that kind of pause and step back, um, you know, we're not, you're not 1200 years a civilization. Um, we are still very close to, to the, the experiences um, that still traumatize us. Um, and I think that's something that we have to also acknowledge um, and, and, and think about it in that broad context. Yeah, I would jump in and say that, um, first of all, one of the most special moments in my career as a journalist was receiving one of my Emmys and being handed the Emmy by Mae Jameson. And I was so overwhelmed by the reality, not by the Emmy, not by the award, but I was meeting Mae Jameson, like the first black female astronaut. I remember I could, I was actually pregnant, like about eight months pregnant. I could barely walk up the steps. I was shaking. And then she handed it to me and she hugged me. And all I wanted to do was weep. I didn't know that I could speak when I got to the microphone because these moments of first, they are important. They inspire us. We do need to tell the stories of lynching. We do need to keep the, our experience 
you know, through slavery at the forefront. We do need to tell the stories of redlining, of what happened during reconstruction, of what goes on today with healthcare and black people in America. We have to tell those stories, but we also have to tell the firsts and the seconds and the thirds. Like we have to tell the stories of excellence, not just of our pain, but of our joys and of those peaks when we climb over them. Like these are all along the spectrum of stories that need to be told. Meaning May Jameson that day when I won that Emmy is something that I will carry with me forever. Um, and, and it's because of her, if it was just anybody else, I might not be able to name that person. In fact, I can't tell you who handed me the other ones. I remember May Jameson. It's, it's important to, to know these things. And then the last thing I'll say is going back to this notion of quantifying, we can quantify our experiences one by one by these first, but we also have to do it on a very large scale. And, and recently uh, Nielsen's, the company that measures television ratings announced that they're going to start quantifying and sharing data on, on diversity. They should have been doing this years ago. Like, yay, thank you. But the tech has been around a while. You could have done it a long ago. And the reason it's happening now is technologists are stepping into that space. And that's why Nielsen's is starting to give that data. So great, you're doing it, but that data alone isn't enough. The question is, now that we are gonna see on a daily base, basis, quantifiable information about who is on screen and who's behind the camera, what do we do with that information? The question isn't just about the data, that's not a solution, that's evidence. What do we do next as we get this information that is gonna be increasingly available to us? Yeah. And I, I would also say, like, I would ask too, and part of this is simply simply informed by the conversations that I that I have had a number of times over, where data can be kind of a, a two headed trap. On the one hand, we we don't feel comfortable making certain decisions without the data, without knowing that this you know movie with black leads will sell. Uh, and we'll do numbers internationally and et cetera. Like we don't feel comfortable putting the production budget behind it that we might something else. Um, the absence of data is a problem, but the presence of data can also be a problem uh, in the event that you don't have something that aligns closely with the PWC survey from a few years ago that says, you know, ah, yes, executive teams and boards of directors with more diversity tend to, for companies tend to perform better revenue wise. Um, if we don't have that, if we have something that maybe says actually, you know, this, this, uh, this book by, you know, the, the books generally by the black people that we published last year just didn't quite do the numbers that we did. That becomes evidence of like why we should continue to underinvest in certain kinds of authors. Uh, and so it, data can be a trap in both directions. And so I, I guess my, my question, my thought, my like, let's, let's jam on this for a minute is, what is that, how do we prevent data from becoming a trap on both sides of that? We have to do the thing and have the evidence to, to make the case, but also we have to convince people to make the right decision sometimes when the case doesn't 100% support it because it's history and our history has been shit biased forever. I don't have an answer, I have questions, but, but I, I hope we could get at least closer, you know? So look, I, I just wanna go back to, to the, so that's a great point, but I wanna connect two things that both Geraldine and you said, Kendra, um, are around not only rushing to praise the firsts, but also celebrating Black excellence and how that comes together. You know, I read an article recently that talks about this, this idea of the Black excellence industrial complex, right? This idea that, you know, when you look at, um, what, well, Jesus and the Black Messiah, this movie today that's gotten so much praise would not have been made had, not, had we not seen the success of a Black Panther, of a Selma, Right, and so when you think about quantifying uh, black excellence um, and, and praising first, you know, there is something to be said about these movies having been made with very little budget, but still being successful. But what does that look like going forward when you have other projects that may not have been as successful, 
but still are as important in helping in helping us get to where we need to be as far as creating more opportunity for um, the seconds and the thirds and not so much the firsts. Right. Uh, Lavi Ajayi, I heard her speak uh, probably a year and a half ago, ago at, like, at, uh, at a conference. And one of the things that she was saying was that when she was doing her first book proposal, like they publishers ask you for comps. What are, what are books that exist that are similar uh, to, to what you're trying to, to the project you're trying to put together here? Uh, and the problem for her was that all of the comps, all of the things she loved, like on the side, she was told like, actually, please don't name that. Like that didn't do so, so well. And so like she struggled to find uh, black femme writers, black women writers who, who she could cite in her comps because like, the numbers hadn't been great, but then, you know, her book came out, she hit the bestseller list. And one of the things that like she said was so important about that was whew, now my book can be named in the comps for all of the writers who come after me. And that is so incredibly important. That is the incredibly important piece of black excellence in my, in my mind, in my view. But on the other hand, it's like, this isn't a hurdle that other individuals, other typically white individuals have to jump. Right. There, there is more space for mediocrity. There is more space for for sustainability and just okay. I, it makes I, it, yeah. I ahead. just wanted to jump in on that, and and I was actually as we were um, having our conversations leading up to today, I was I went back to the work uh, of of Richard Jean So, who uh, in his book Redlining Culture, and when he looked at the data of book publishing. Um, and, and, the, and, and I think the, to the point that you just made, Kendra, um, looking at who was published, um, and he, he spent time talking about um, what was published by Random House when Toni Morrison was there um, and what happened after she left. Um, you know, and, and we can isolate, and he looks at the data of Black writers um, who were published across the industry. Um, one to just kind of uh, temper this this notion that we've moved all of a sudden into this space of multiculturalism in the book publishing industry, um, which is actually not the case when you look at the data. And this goes to your question, you know, then what do we do with that? Um, and and what I also kind of took away from his work is that we really have to think about the system that is connected to that. It's not just who gets published. It's what happens after that gets that those works get published. Um, it is that system that ultimately leads to re book reviews, uh, that ultimately leads to book sales, that ultimately leads to awards, that ultimately leads to the next book, um, and so the cycle continues. Um, so I think one thing that we can do with the data is to say, where in the cycle? Will the data be most important to kind of break the cycle, essentially? Um, and, and that goes to, I think, many of the things that we've been talking about uh, and that we will talk about, which is who's making the decision about what gets published, um, who's making the decision about what gets reviewed, um, who's making the decision about who gets the award. Um, and, and, and it goes to the importance of representation. It goes to making sure that writers, that there's a system that elevates and uncovers what is invisible to the systems because the actors in those systems also have bias. Um, so it, it takes me in a few different directions. Yeah, I would say like, if I had to kind of sum this up a little bit, I think that there's a question of like, where is the data and where do we just need to be brave? Where do we just need to make the right decision because we know it's right? Where do we just need to, to give the funding knowing that like, if data is the evidence of what we have done culturally, we are responsible for also making culture. And so the decisions that we make based on this data will in fact become our future data that we can learn from. So where do we need to be brave? Where do we need to push? Can I jump in? Yeah, I mean, I would add to that, like not only is there a, a challenge with um, you know, barriers to entry and, and telling our stories, the, the challenge is also when one person succeeds, people check their boxes and says, they say, that, okay, we're done. We did one of those, right? So for instance, Polly Murray, 
And most of you listening today probably have never heard her name before, but Polly Murray is someone you should know. We have civil rights laws and changes in those laws because of Polly Murray. And she was a first, she was the first black person to earn, I think it was like doctor of science of law from Yale. I think that's what she had, but she was also a woman's rights activist. She helped founded now. She was a priest. She was queer. She was an, an attorney. She was a lot, but we don't know Polly Murray's story. We don't hear it. And now there's one documentary. And I had a conversation recently, um, an industry conversation with an executive in the industry who said, it's such a great doc, I'm so glad it's done. And I said, well, we should do more. And the response was, no, her story is told now. Well, her story was told, it was at Sundance, it might get a small audience, it might get distribution, but so what? Like, why do we tell it one time and think it's enough. There are so many ways to tell her story. And not only that, you know, talking about documenting your story and, and data around it, there is an archive at um, Radcliffe Institute at um, Harvard with 122 audio recordings that Polly Murray made of herself. She would just have these long conversations and because she was convinced Nobody would tell her story. So what did she do? She documented her story herself with audio recordings. I think there are over 900 photographs. She collected all of her work in detail with paperwork, with audio, with photographs so that it could be preserved and people could find it later on. Well, she died, I think in the, I think in the eighties and, and now there's one doc. You can pick one audio recording and tell so many stories about her queerness, about her um, femininity and feminist um, intentions and, and drive, about civil rights, what she did, who she influenced, about breaking barriers, about being a priest. At the end of her life, she, she became a priest. Like there's so many ways to cut this, but the way that our industries work is we feel like we've checked a box, we've done it once and that's enough. And the reality is we don't have to stop and we can also tell our own stories. Yeah. I'm and so we need to. By that. I'm so inspired by that, Geraldine, just that, uh, just such a reminder of, of the agency that we all have to tell our own stories and to make that, to, to quantify that future ourselves, um, of ourselves. I'm so inspired by that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, I, so I definitely love that, especially in the age of social media, especially in the age of Substack and the age of like, we all, we have the tools to get our thoughts out there and documented, but also like there is this kind of ephemerality to that. Where is the, I mean, where is my teenage live journal, for example? Um, and so there is a certain amount of care that I think comes to the archiving. And also just like, you know, thinking about Polly Murray and thinking about like just the data that is my house and my, my own personal library. How many biographies do I have of Malcolm X on my shelves in my, in my one bedroom Brooklyn apartment? several and we've got one Polly Murray documentary like there is also equity for us to to think about and for us to seek when we when we think about the ways we amplify black excellence and like how many films like super bad we have like it's got to be Malcolm X to have a biopic but like super bad is a very popular film like we don't get to have regular regular stuff we have to have a, an inspirational, uh, excellent story for it to be deemed good enough. You know, they say that um, all wars are fought twice, first on the battlefield and, and then in memory. Hmm. We have to make sure that we are creating memory by telling these stories. We have to make sure that these stories are perpetuated and continue on so that we know how to make informed choices. And, and this is all data that is available to us. We keep telling us this narrative that this information's not there. Mm 
right? We're not, we haven't captured it. We've captured the data, it's there. We can find slave narratives. We can find narratives of lynchings. We can find narratives of firsts, but we have to tell those stories. We have to create memory. Yeah. We have to look for them and we have to tell them. Uh, one of my favorite pandemic projects is by um, Kimberly Drew, um, who is the former uh, social media manager for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She's brilliant in many ways, um, but so she has been doing this uh, Substack um, near daily newsletter, sometimes more, more frequent than others, called Something I Saw, where all she does is pick one piece of art that she has seen at some point write, you know, write or just share the art, like, but little blurb art and that's it. And like, I love that as such an interesting document of like the things that are important to her. Um, and it's not big, it's not flashy, but it brings so much joy and so much additional knowledge to like my daily on a, on a semi-regular basis. Um, so I, I would encourage us to all think about like, what are the things that we can do to tell these stories and to tell more of them because there are so many and we don't, I mean, as much as like, I am very much enjoying the, the newest Malcolm X biography that I was given for my birthday a few months ago. I also didn't necessarily need that more than I needed the new brilliant biography of Toni Morrison even or whomever else. Um, all right, so when we start to think about how we leverage all of this to, to be forward-looking, to move beyond this moment that we're in right now, I'd like to think a little bit about quantifying something also very ephemeral and like quantifying hope. So like there are stories of excellence and stories of achievement, but where are our stories And what are our, what is our data that is able to quantify kind of where that next could be, what that future could look like? I often look to science fiction because I'm a big sci-fi nerd, um, but I wonder if there are other things that kind of come into the mix for everyone else. I love the phrase, you can't ban imagination. And, and I think what's beautiful about this moment of history that we're in is that we can share our imagination. Just look at Black Twitter. Like if you want to see a thread that is political and funny as hell, look at Black Twitter. I mean, you can just go down those rabbit holes. Somebody will start, you know, what did you do with this blank when you were a kid? And people just start filling it in. And so some of it is light and really funny. And then most of it is so political and powerful. So to, to, you can't ban imagination. Like now that we can join in these conversations like a free for all from anywhere, whether it's on you know, one platform or another, we can actually in an unlimited way have these conversations. But I think what's really critical as we talk about hope is it's not enough for us to now have these conversations in these unrestricted ways. That's great. Like don't, I'm not knocking that. But what we don't have is ownership. So yes, we are now stepping into these spaces. We are now creating in unlimited ways with you know, Afro, Afrofuturism, which is art and music and it's comforting and it's healing and it's creative. But what we need is ownership. What we need is more startups and more businesses and more tech, and com tech companies and creative companies and storytelling companies. And we need to own our stuff. We need to tell these stories, but not just tell them, own them. We need to start building our own organizations and institutions, not one here and one there, but a lot of them everywhere. And I'm sorry, that's my dog ringing the bell. <laughs> so I'm gonna mute. And I think we also, um, just to build on that thought, I think what we're, what we're also in need of 
um, is is a reflection on um, what are, when is a reflection on the what we now assume to be important metrics or what we think is evidence of progress towards equity um, is not necessarily you know that it's not necessarily going to get us there completely. Um, so we think Jason and I were talking about this last night. Um, we're looking. We're all looking at data and representation of who's on staff um, and and you know who's in leadership or and who's not in leadership, and and we assume that representation on its own, if we can get there, is going to kind of get us to the promised land of of a certain state of being and 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 value of each other. Um, but I think what we're proposing here is that that doesn't necessarily talk to the human experience of, uh, and hope that people have that their future is actually going to be a future that they, they actually want to experience. Um, and I think that's, what, that's really uh, the push here is to say that is not enough. Uh, representation on its own is not enough. It doesn't necessarily quantify um, the, the real lived experiences of people who are in an organization or who are in society. Yes, we want, we can get there, I think, through um, what we, Jason and I were talking about last night, different proxies of, of representation um, as, as, as some indication that we're moving forward, but we really have to talk about and see, and people need to see themselves, people need to feel um, that there is progress that is happening that is really going to change their health outcomes, um, th th that is going to close the racial wealth gap, that is going to put food on the table, that is going to allow them to get appropriate health care. That, that is what we're hoping to change, that people feel confident in the systems um, that they are interacting with, that, they, that impact their daily lives. I think that's just one aspect of it, but that's one that, that comes to mind when we, when we think about this. Yeah, um, and just to add to that point, Paul, the, the conversation that we had last night um, really talked about that obviously representation is, is not the whole story, but it really is true equity is about unlocking the intersectional value that exists in these spaces, you know, such that you create systems where underrepresented voices are, are heard in the moments that, they, that matter most. And so that is true equity. But looking at it from, uh, you know, with a diversity lens as someone who is a DNI practitioner, uh, and talking about how you measure kind of that that un, the intangible hope, if you will, or, or dreams deferred when you're looking at turnover, when you're looking at black talent coming in and out of organizations, how do you measure that? Uh, and oftentimes we we look at it through the lens of you know whether it's a compensation uh, factor or is it a promotion uh, element, but oftentimes it's it's less tangible than that. Uh, so when we look at measuring equity or the lack thereof, we need to look at things like you know, uh, proxies, as you mentioned, um, that aren't imperfect, but nonetheless can start to signal why there's so much turnover uh, amongst Black folks inside of companies that can also signal a lack of equity. Um, so, you know, I think for me, it's, it's looking at um, the fact that pre-George Floyd, we saw diversity roles, for example, decline by 60% between March and June. But in June alone, we saw diversity roles increase by 50%. What does that signal? That signals that it, you know, true equity and the spirit of wanting to do the right thing inside of corporate spaces, uh, still there's a, there's a lot to be desired in that, in that area uh, still. And so I think, again, it's not a perfect metric, but it can start to signal uh, where we are in terms of the true, the true sentiment around equity. Yeah, I think that's deeply interesting. It says a few things to me, one of which is like, you know, when, when we recognize, as we did kind of early in the year last year, uh, with the beginnings of the, the COVID pandemic, like, we immediately started tightening our belts and diversity is often the first thing that gets kind of considered on the cutting on the cutting block, right. Uh, but then, so immediately thereafter, had major proof points as to as to why exactly this needs to be central to all strategy, not just you know a, a an ancillary part of like what you're committing to as an organization. Um, but we're new in that journey is part of the other evidence that that we draw from this. Like we are new in in this journey. We are new in this particular cycle. Um, 
and we're going to learn a lot. There's history for us to draw from, certainly, but also there's so so far for us to go, both internally within our organizations and then also culturally, certainly. We're at the beginnings of having conversations about you know, the prison industrial complex and the long lasting impact on lives, not just the lives of incarcerated individuals and formerly incarcerated individuals, but families and you know, the stresses that that causes. And it, it won't be until we start talking about you know, a myriad of other issues that disproportionately affect black people and other people of color um, that we, be, but we begin to kind of open our minds within kind of corporate structures to, to really move toward equity in a more holistic way. We've, we've got a ways to go. I think you made a, a great point there, Kendra, and, and um, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about it here, but um, certainly a lot of research has gone into it uh, Resma Manicum in his work, my, and grand, my, my grandmother's hands comes to mind about the that the, the transfer of trauma across generations, um, and the transfer of that trauma and how that affects hope. Um, and it's it can it is qualitative in in many ways. Um, but I, I you know I think we could all reflect you know on the experience of our of our own families um, and 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 think about how that intergenerational trauma and the emotional weight um, of those experiences does move through generations. Um, and I think it's an important piece to this conversation um, to think about that. Um, as we think about how do we quantify hope, we do have to look across generations. And, and what does that say about you know, the way that my grandparents may have thought about you know, what they're preparing for me in terms of the future? and how they lived their lives in preparation what, for what they believed was possible uh, for me or not possible uh, in many cases. Um, and I think we could tell many stories about that and we've seen many stories told about that. Definitely. And then I think what equity might mean in a, in a closer context in certain ways too. When we do have you know, intergenerational wealth gaps and, and a myriad of other issues like you know what, throwing out an idea here, but perhaps it makes sense to, to pay uh, entry-level employees of color slightly more adjusted for the fact that they are disproportionately likely to have student loans and to not have support from, from various family members. Like, is there a way that we can kind of begin to correct within organizations or, or begin to correct as a society for the fact that we know that there will disproportionately be certain tolls and certain obstacles to certain individuals by, by no fault of their own uh, are, are grappling with in addition to the, the difficulties of, of daily life. Here's a question for you, Kendra. Do you think that uh, compensation, financial compensation is enough to kind of uh, overcome some of that? We, you know, when you think about all of the other considerations uh, that black employees have, whether it's, you know, microaggressions, harassment, uh, daily macro, I'll call them macroaggressions. Uh, but, but how else can we compensate uh, black employees for, 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 the, for the things that they have to deal with on a daily basis? Definitely. I mean, I don't think that, that compensation is nearly enough. I mean, it's, it's a start. It's perhaps a beginning. It's a, it's a recognition in certain ways, right? Um, on, in our capitalist society, it is how we, we say that, you know, invalidate that we value some, some kind of work. Um, but of it's absolutely not uh, enough to, to counter the very real impact and trauma of racial aggressions and gender aggressions and other, you know, traumas that are being inflicted on individuals every day uh, as a regular matter of course. Uh, we need to start thinking about a lot of other things. We need to think about mental health very seriously. Um, I myself have an autoimmune disease that is very much genetic. Every femme in my family, every woman in my family for the most part has it. Mine kicked in a little bit earlier in part because I'm usually surrounded by a lot of stress. And so there are all sorts of different things that we're, we're going to need to think about and accommodate and, and make space for and compensate. Um, and we're gonna wanna experiment with things that I think are probably pretty creative, but it's worth starting. It's worth, I, if, if America is still an experiment, like. I, I love an experiment and I love kind of embodying that as much as possible in many parts of my life, whether it's experimenting to find the best tacos in my neighborhood, um, 
taco truck down the street or if it's something you know if it's something else entirely it's it's testing new machine learning algorithms and models and experimenting in that regard like we're going to need to do a lot of experiments we're going to need to try a lot of things right now in stockton california uh there are universal basic income tests uh, and experiments going on. Uh, that will be very interesting to see how that plays out in an American context. But yeah, we will continue to experiment. We need to continue to experiment. And then the results of those experiments are the data that we use to build our next experiments. And, we, and I think we have to experiment across a range of territories. Um, and I think we've, you know, we've had, as we've been preparing for this conversation, I think we've touched, uh, you know, on so many of those, but um, absolutely, yes, we need to think about it in the context of our workforce uh, and, and, and what younger employees are experiencing uh, and how they uh, experience uh, systems of inequity. Um, we need to think about it in the context of our media and entertainment, as we've been talking about, um, and how the images that are shaped um, by certain actors are affecting what we actually see in terms of stories of resistance and resilience, um, uh, evidence of mediocrity, um, and those and double standards of mediocrity and failure. Um, and we need to think about it in terms of our technology and the solutions that we have. And I think part of what, you know, what's exciting for me is um, to, to be able to look broadly across, you know, as we've been doing across culture to say, these all intersect. These are not happening in isolation. Um, they can be examined in isolation, but they're very much hooked together because it's all part of the culture that we're in. And it's all part of the legacy uh, that we've experienced in America. Um, and I think the, 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 the part that, that really excites me and um, the part that I'm most curious about um, is the accountability piece, um, is how do we keep uh, compensation, as Jason kind of threw out, might be one way of, of driving it forward, but then we have to think and talk about um, how do we hold each other accountable? How do we hold the systems accountable to make sure that we're moving forward? What are those metrics um, you know, of, of accountability? What are those systems that hold, us, hold each other accountable, hold us accountable? And, and that's where technology comes in. If we, you know, we are in a new era now. There's a new administration in DC. We are now post 2020. So, and we know the world fell apart in 2020, but we're still standing, right? Um, and, and, and now we do have to, people keep talking about uniting. How do we build bridges? How do we overcome these divisions that we have in this country? But we can't overcome anything till we have truth commissions, till we're speaking truth, and we can't overcome anything until we have accountability. So to move forward, we need to have metrics of what's going on, what's happening, where, we, for instance, I can give you a specific example. We've, we're in a pandemic still. We see all kinds of businesses closing. We know that phenomena of first hired, last hired, first fired. I want to see data on corporate America on who, with all the downsizing that's been happening and the businesses that are closing, who are the first row of people being removed? Who's losing their jobs? What are the demographics? I want to see accountability figures for all of Wall Street. Uh, how much are they earning every year while millions of people in this country are losing. I wanna see that data. It is, it's all quantifiable. And, and just one last, I know we're wrapping, but one last thing, we're talking about tech. Let's not forget tech is a tool and it has biases and it has limitations and things that restrict it from telling complete stories. So yes, let's use these tools, let's build them, but don't forget those tools are made by human beings. Those are algorithms. And those algorithms are filled with all the same biases we have. So gather the data, but make sure we're analyzing the tools that gather the data too, because it might be telling us incomplete pictures. <laughs>
Absolutely, absolutely. I think about, um, Sarah, I know we're wrapping up too, but um, I think about w- one of the reports that, um, that was released early on by the city of New York early on in the pandemic um, about the demographics of frontline workers. Um, their both racial um, immigrant status, um, you know, and I think that this goes to the point of, you know, so what, what do we do with that data? Um, I think we, you know, it was one, it was important to reveal that because as soon as we started, here's an example and, and, and kind of the, the thought that I had is when we talk about return to office, uh, which we all have, you know, talked about and then slowed down and then started talking about and then not started talking about again, um, it has a very real impact on, on certain communities. It wasn't just that COVID affected literally the lives disproportionately of marginalized communities. But now as we talk about how do we return, how do we go forward, we have to keep that same level of analysis because the, the people who would go first, the, the people who we would need in order to open those offices are marginalized communities. Um, and we have to do a more thoughtful planning process that accommodates you know, the composition of of the workforce that's required to do the thing that we're all talking about doing in the first place to rebuild um, and build back better or just to rebuild and reopen. Um, And I think it's that kind of planning um, with that's where the data comes in, Um, but we have to look at that first. uh, And we have to think about that before we go into, here's the best way for, for this office, even at the very granular level um, to even come back what disproportionate impact will it have on the communities that are actually required to do that in the very first place? Um, and that's what I think about when I think about, you know, how do we, how do we take that data and apply it more equitably? Um, and that's just an example of where I think we can do that. Where we can definitely do more. I love that. More, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you so much for sharing space with me, for, for having this conversation. I love any chance I get to talk with all of you and feel like I come out of it smarter with a with a better canon uh, and reading list for myself um, and and really hopeful and I hope that that is is translating to to everyone watching so thank you all again uh, for sticking with us Uh, and just a, a quick note as we as we wrap things up Sparks and Honey is planning on hosting a follow-up conversation to this conversation. One of the things that I always hope for uh, or always wish for when I do something that's like a really juicy conversation like this is like, what happens if we come back together a few weeks from now uh, and have a similar conversation again? Where are our heads now? What have we read in addition? Um, what, do we, what did we wish that we'd gotten to say that, that escaped our minds when we were deeply in the moment with one another? So we're planning on doing that and we hope that you'll join us. And should you want any information about that follow-up conversation uh, or anything else in general, please feel free to go to sparksandhoney.com for more information. And we hope to see you again soon. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Mm